in. The locus of the economy once resided in the family. This is certainly true of Reformation Europe. We now live in a statist hell, and the locus of the economy now resides in the state. So statist is the culture in which we live now that even before parents leave the hospital with their newborn, they've already committed three statist acts. They've gotten their child, number one, their first vaccination. Number two, they've gotten their child a birth certificate. And number three, they've obtained for their child a social security number. The social security number is the quintessential symbol of state control and ownership of people. But it's worse than that. It's an actual tool of state control and ownership of people. The social security number is designed to enslave people. Slavery in itself is inescapable. Some men are slaves to sin. Some men are slaves to the state. Most men are slaves to both. We as Christians are to be slaves to Christ. And 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 23 says, You were bought with a price. Do not become the slaves of men. And for that reason, me and my wife Clara determined as a young couple that we would not enumerate our children with social security numbers, that we would allow them to decide themselves when they came of age. And we have a position paper on our table regarding the reasons for that. Understand that this number is the nexus that gives the state jurisdiction over all your financial doings. Understand that this number is the apex of a dishonest money system created out of mere fiat, one which allows the state to observe all your financial dealings and invade your domestic and familial affairs. When people hear that our kids don't have social security numbers, they're horrified. They're like, ha, 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 how will they get a, a driver's license? How will, how will they get a passport? Ha, 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 will the sun come up tomorrow? They're horrified. There's lots of myths about living without a social security number. Me and my wife come with 37 years of experience of children, raising children without social security numbers. Let me give you some of the things you can do without a social security number. You can get a passport without a social security number. You can get a driver's license without a social security number. Um, after the Patriot Act, everybody's like, oh, you can't get a driver's license without a social security number. We did it in Wisconsin. My son Jeremiah was the first to do it. We've helped scores of families in Wisconsin since with the same conviction, get driver's license without social security numbers. Overcame it. You can get a hunting license. Guess what? You can get any kind of license. <laughs> You can also work for an employer. You're not going to work for a major corporation because they don't want to be bothered with people like you, but you can find a sole proprietor or a small businessman. And all my kids have worked as employees for employers without a social security number. You can have your own business without a social security number and work with other businesses without a social security number. My 18-year-old son, Matthew, just this last week, signed on with a contract with another company, with his company, to do window washing. He's 18 years old, has all very successful window washing business and they wanted a W-9 from him so that they could then issue him a 1099. My son told him we don't I don't have a social security number and then he also informed him that you have to understand under the law all you're required to do is to ask me of it twice and you fulfilled your obligation to the law and there's nothing left for you to do and they said fine consider yourself asked twice we love you. We want you to do this work. <laughs> and he got this multi-thousand dollar contract with this company. You can claim your kids on your, on your tax return without a social security number. Our church developed an affidavit which has helped literally hundreds of families with the same conviction across this nation. Some were not getting the tax deduction for their kids for years because they didn't know and they just were not going to enumerate their kids. And they learned from the affidavit we made. They're able to get it. And there's one other thing you can do. You can just not get one. <laughs> it is voluntary. If you go down to the Social Security Administration building and pull out their little pamphlet that says, now that I have a newborn, it says in the very first paragraph, getting a Social Security number is voluntary. But you do realize you can enslave yourself voluntarily. It's been going on since the 
man's immemorial. There's two things I've learned over the years that you can't do. One is you won't join the military if you're an American citizen without a social security number. If you're a foreigner, you can join. If you're an illegal alien, you can join without a social security number, but not an American. That isn't all that bad news to a lot of us. The second thing you'll never do is open a bank account. You will not do it. I spent hours on the phone with three different banks, all the way up with the highest corporate attorneys, all the way to New York City. <laughs> And they all told me the same thing. There is no law that says you have to have a social security number to open a bank account, but we have on file a letter from the government that essentially says we'll make your life a living hell for you if you open a bank account without a social security number. So we've learned to get around that, even that. Necessity is the mother of invention. Or as my mom always used to say to us, where there's a will, there's a way. One of the things that came out of us not enumerating our children was that our kids um, started businesses. They were grousing about not getting a job at McDonald's and somebody like their other kids. I said, you need to think outside the box. Let's start a business. What business do you think you do? We're blue collar stock. So we, we all do blue collar stuff, all my kids' businesses. And I learned that this is going to involve a lot of sacrifice, helping my kids with business. But you know what else it produced? This closeness with my sons and my daughters, working through building these businesses with them. And they all have their own businesses. My oldest boy has a, a landscaping outfit, does great, makes really good money, hard worker. My next son has a window washing business, makes 50 to $75 an hour washing windows. Um, my 18-year-old, I told you about him. I have two sons-in-laws who started businesses. They're making uh, really good money doing floors and the other doing painting. Blue-collar stuff. My 16-year-old daughter just started a home cleaning business six months ago. She's averaging $14 to $18 an hour and building things. And my 13-year-old has started a dog poop cleaning up business out of the yard. And guess what? You can make $40 to $50 an hour cleaning dog poop out of people's yards. I teach our, we teach our kids the same thing. The biggest way to build your business is have a good work ethic and a good attitude. Word of mouth is the best business builder. And that's what my kids do. And within three years, they don't have to advertise. They have so much work in their business. It's not even funny. Gives them something they can always do all their life. Children have, most children, have an innate desire to work, to achieve, to grow up, to risk, to contribute to the family economy and to the community economy at large, to use their innate gifts to the glory of God. But we live in a country that has a education system that puts a wet blanket over all that initiative, keeps them at a desk, for, desk forever, never allowing them to mature, take on responsibility, contribute to the economy, become a man and become a woman. And sadly, parents aid and abet this whole nonsense. Let me tell you a story. When my 15 and 17 year old sons started their window washing business with them, me and my wife were driving them, you know, because my son didn't have his driver's license yet. And so we drop them off at this big house. We go around the corner. There's a garage sale. You know anything about my wife, Claire? There's a garage sale. The car stop. So we stop. We go in. I walk into this garage. I've never seen anything at garage sales worth anything. She's looking at the debris. I pick up a conversation with a lady. And I said to her, I said, yeah, our 15 and 17-year-old started this little window washing business. And they're around the corner doing your neighbor's yard. And she looks at me in shock. And she says, you know a 15 and 17-year-old that'll work? And I said, yeah. And she goes, well, let me tell you, I have a 16-year-old, and he never works. He doesn't do anything around the house. Neither do any of his friends. In fact, they just sit around and play video games all day. Well, while we're talking, all of a sudden this guy walks across, who's at the garage sale also, and he walks up to me and he says, pardon me, but did I hear you say that your 15- and 17-year-old started a little window washing business? I said, yeah. And he goes, well, I just want you to know that I think you're an irresponsible parent. And then he went on to tell me how I was robbing them of their childhood. And he was passionate. He went on for like two minutes. And when he finally took a breath, I've learned over the years a good way to respond in those situations is to ask a question. So I looked at him and I said, do you know how old the youngest Pony Express rider was? And he had this look on his face like, what the blank does that have to do with what we're talking about? And finally he says, no, I don't. And I said... He was 11, and many of them were 13. 
Could you imagine how many federal laws they'd be violating today? And then I went into my little two-minute speech about how we keep young men and women perpetually adolescent in this culture, never let them grow up, achieve, risk, contribute to the family and community economy. And the woman is literally standing behind this guy with both of their thumbs in the air like, yeah! And that's when I realized it's her husband. <laughs> and now I knew why her 16-year-old didn't want to work. <laughs> you know, it's crazy. The Chihuahua Nation is at war with the status dogs that run this country. Understand, I grew up in Detroit. Detroit is a status nightmare. They teach you from a young age that the state exists for you. Get as much out of the trough as you can. You want to be dependent on the state. That's what they teach you. You're totally ignorant of that fact that with the shekels come the shackles. It's a complete nightmare. After I was saved and came to know Christ, I told, I, I saw my life change. I wanted to work before I was late. I wanted to work. I wanted to produce. It was a recession going on in Detroit. I was doing any odd jobs when I married my wife, Clara, including driving a taxi. And one of the things I saw when I drove the taxi was the statism that we lived in and the nightmare and the evil, that the evil that it creates. It creates evil. And every month when everybody got their food stamps, I'd get call after call for the first week of that month. And here's what I would do. Pick a guy up. He'd tell me to go to the grocery store. Go to the grocery store. He'd take his food stamps in. The grocer would give him 50 cents on the dollar. The guy's happy because now he has cash in his hand. The grocer's happy because he got 100% more than he would have got if the guy bought groceries. He gets back in my cab. tells me to go to this house. It's a drug house. He goes into the drug house. He buys his drugs. comes back out. And then he says, now you can take me home. I do that over and over and over again. The Bible says that the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. And they are. That's not helping those men. It's destroying their lives. When I used to go to jail for interposing at the doors of the abortion clinic, I would meet young men in there who would get checks for $5,000, $8,000, $12,000, $14,000 in back pay from SSI, which is funded through the Social Security tax, because it is a tax. And they would blow it all, and they'd get $500 a month after that. And many of them died young. The tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. It's evil. I saw that I lived poorly in Detroit, and I saw there were politicians who just wanted to use us for their own political ends. And I've been at war with them ever since then. Tertullian tells a story in his book, De Corona Militis, about a Roman soldier who refused to wear a bay of leaves on a sacred day to a pagan deity. And all the other soldiers mocked him for it and derided him for it, and word got out about it, and even the Christians were mocking him for it. And Tertullian defended him and said, this soldier is more of a soldier of Christ and more constant than all his brethren. The Christians who were attacking him were saying this, Where is it written in all the word of God that we should not wear bays upon our heads? And Tertullian responded by saying, Where is it written that we may do it? We must look into the scriptures to see what we may do and not think it enough that the scripture does not forbid directly this or that very particular. There is no scripture that says do not get a social security number. But Claire and I, from our study of Scripture, came to the conviction that what the state is doing there is wrong and that we would not enslave our children with the Social Security number, that we would stand in defiance of them, our own little war, so to speak. I began this talk by stating that the locus of the economy used to reside in the family, and now it resides in the state. And me and Claire, as a young couple, were like, how can we bring that back to the family? How can we bring it back to the family? And we decided two things. We would not enumerate our kids with Social Security numbers. And we would never send our kids to a government school. And we had no idea at that time that it would produce this great blessing called building businesses together as a family. We were forced into it out of circumstance because of them being unenumerated. Understand, we don't think less of people who have Social Security numbers. Some of our children who became adults ended up getting social security numbers. 
This is a great evil that's embedded in our culture. It took generations to get to where we're at. If God doesn't bring us judgment and just level it all, it could take a long time to get us out. We live by example. We declare what we believe with our words. It must be a conviction because you will be inconvenienced if you're not enumerated with a social security number. Let me end with this. Assertions without application is theory. Assertions without application is theory. I'm 59 years old now, and one of the things I've noticed over all these years is that men love theory. They hate application. Me and my wife have never been that way. We want to apply our Christianity in every area of life. When we read the writings of the Reconstructionists, wow, they fleshed it out in their writings. I was like, this is awesome. This is necessary. This is why John Knox is a hero in our home. Because he always wanted to apply the Word of God to every area of life. And this is why you are our friends. Because you're of the same mind. God bless you all.